Okay, so we're going to try and get this going. Raised beds have been around for centuries. It's just one of those things that we've sort of rediscovered. And because we've rediscovered it, it's through need. We have a lot more people doing gardening, and raised beds for our climate are an excellent way to garden. Basically, what is a raised bed? Listen carefully, there'll be a test at the end. <laughs> um, basically, the soil in your bed is a higher level than the native soil. They're typically small. And when I say small, that's in comparison to a farm field. Okay. Um, they're connected to the native soil. So even if you just sit a box on top of the ground and you fill it with dirt, that, that counts. And they should have at least one third native soil in the mix. The rest can be organic. But your native soil, regardless of how poor it is, has a lot of your microorganisms in it that you're going to need to help your plants absorb the nutrients. So don't just get rid of it. Okay, today we're going to cover the benefits of the raised garden beds, the basics of making one, examples of materials and their safety, steps to making an unframed raised bed, which is the simplest and easiest, and some tips to construct and maintain raised garden beds. So one of the benefits is because you've raised it up and because it's a small space you can amend the soil easily, you can get a nice light, well-draining soil. And well-draining soils are what we need here because we get a lot of rain. So when they're well-drained, that also means the soil is going to be warmer. And that means that you've got an earlier season to start things. And you see the soil thermometer. They are being sold across the hallway for $8 a piece, I believe it is. And yes, I do use mine. And you will find that at the edge of your raised bed, the temperature will be much warmer. Do not take the temperature in full sun. It will be measuring the wrong thing. OK, so I use them. The middle of the bed is typically going to be a little bit cooler. But if the bed is warm, you have faster growth and bigger harvests. So another benefit is that you have walkways. Almost always you have walkways around a raised bed. That keeps your little feet out of the garden bed. Is that important? Yes. It's called compaction. And what does that mean? Well, in the soil, we ha it's kind of a granular mix. If you get it under a high power enough, you'll see that it's little grains. And in between those grains, what you're going to see is little spaces. And those little spaces are for air and water and roots. So if you squeeze those spaces together, there isn't a space for water or air or roots, and your plants will not thrive. Think of when you've seen a building, and it's got this little, what we call a drip line. Have you seen those? They're like this little ditch. I used to think that when the water dropped, it splashed out some grains of soil. Well, typically, if you look closely, the soil kind of comes along like this, and then it dips in. And that's because every little raindrop that falls is compacting the soil. We are not little raindrops. So it's really easy for us to compact the soil. Defined beds, to me, are a real benefit with maintenance. And the reason is, I do a lot better weeding a section that big. Because by the time I finish, then I've got an accomplishment. I, I don't know whether it's human nature, but it's mine. <laughs> The other benefit of having small beds is they really are ideal for putting in drip systems or soaker hoses for watering. That means you're watering at ground level, you're not sprinkling over the top. Watering from the top of your plants waters the foliage. 
and the foliage is where our disease problems can start. So water from below. Some of the materials you can use for walkways will give you access even in the winter. Sometimes that's important because some of us are learning to do winter gardening. I'm still in the learning process. And the one on the right here is not a raised bed. It's just framed to try to keep the, the um, ground material in there, the wood chips. However, we have geese at our community garden and they don't like it in the frames. We learned that this year. So the basics, you need to make some decisions. And so that's kind of the basics. You start with your decisions. And right now, you can go out and you can look at your areas and see where you can put a garden. So location. You can think about the orientation, the type of raised bed you're going to do, framed or unframed, and what kind of materials you might want, attachments. And you want to size your beds to the site as well as to the gardener. And we'll say more about all of these later. The materials that are out there for framed beds and how safe are they, the materials for walkways, and steps to make a simple raised bed. So location, and I included here site preparation. Most of the plants that we are going to be growing really want to have eight or more hours of sunshine. Will they grow with six? They will. They simply won't produce quite as well. And we want as much production for our effort as what we can get. Now this is the time of year when if the soil is wet, just go back and look at your seed catalogs for heaven's sakes. How do you know if the soil's too wet? You can put some in your hand and you can squeeze it and if any drops come out, sorry, go back inside. The other way, because sometimes we forget about squeezing it, the other way to do it is you take your shovel and you stick it in and you do one shovel full over. If the pile that you put there looks just like the imprint of your shovel, go back inside and read the seed catalogs. <laughs> if your soil has already been amended and has a lot of organics in it, you'll be, it'll drain well and you'll get to garden sooner. So when you are out here and you're thinking about a location, cut the grass really, really short. Remove all of your persistent weeds. What's a persistent weed that we deal with here? Dandelions. Dandelions. Everybody says that one first. What else? Crabgrass. Crab grass. Sometimes it's quake grass and not crabgrass, but they're pretty much pigweed. How about dock? Does anybody know what dock is? They're a big leaf thing. They have a huge root, and you dig and dig and dig. Oh, blackberries. No. Okay, so you've got to get rid of all that stuff. Large rocks. That kind of goes without saying. The orientation. Now the main thing I want you to remember about orientation, because not all of us can do an east-west or north-south, because sometimes the direction of our house and the direction of our yard is going to dictate that part. But it's important to remember, your tallest plants are going to go on the north side. Now why would that be? Because the sun comes from the other way and the north isn't going to shade anybody. So if you want pole beans or tomatoes, and yeah, my tomatoes seem to go five feet plus, plus, plus. Now, if you have the space, an east-west orientation is good for growing all short plants. But you can, let's see, I bet we have to do that there. You can go ahead and have an east-west and put a few tall plants on the north side. Now, obviously, if you're stacking your beds up and you've got three or four, take the northwest bed, the northmost bed, and put your tall things in that one because otherwise they could shade the rest of them. You need to decide whether you want a framed or unframed. I recommend the unframed for people who have not gardened before. And maybe even for people who aren't certain that this is the spot they want to do raised beds in. At least the first year. And you will have already worked the soil, so you've lost nothing. Framed beds look very nice, and so if your only garden space is the front yard, you might within a year want to go to framed beds. Think about attachments. The types of attachments that you can do range from a cold frame. This one actually is sitting on another frame inside there. What about seeding? I can tell you from experience, if you take a two, two by four or two by anything and you put it up this way and think you're gonna sit on this two, uh-uh, uh-uh. It really does not work well. So if you think ahead, Depending on the materials you're using, you may need to do that. And here, my husband, let's go back. My husband was very bright 
and we poured bolts into the concrete so that we could put on a frame like this. Now originally that was to keep deer out of the garden and now we expanded it because the deer got to be more aggressive. <laughs> well, you know. Also think about the size. What if you just want to grow potatoes? Do you need to have a four by eight raised bed where you're going to dig them up? No. You can do something on this nature and you're going to fill it in with straw and soil and straw and soil and you can have your potatoes all the way down. You can lift it off afterwards, which may be a little difficult, or dig it from the bottom with this particular box. Fit the garden's beds to the gardener's reach. What I found out fairly soon from doing a 4x8 is that 4x8 is a convenient dimension of lumber. <laughs> it is not convenient for a gardener to reach into. And while I can reach two feet, I end up either putting a hand to support myself into the garden bed, it's called compaction, or stepping into the garden bed. So for me, I need one that's a little bit smaller. The, the rule of thumb at this point has always been if it's only accessible from one, one side, no deeper than two feet. Accessible from four, from both sides, no more than four feet. I personally think that three feet should be the maximum. And you get plants in there and then it starts getting really difficult. And you want to fit the beds to the site. This site is really interesting. A slope. How many of you have slopes in your yard? Oh yeah, yeah. Is that where the sun is? Sometimes. The other thing with raised beds is if you've got a slope and the only place to put a garden is at the bottom, well guess what flows to the bottom? Besides water? Cold air. So sometimes just raising a bed 18 inches will keep your plants happier because they'll be warmer. These beds, I believe, were about three feet by six. Nice dimension. Materials. So some of us are blessed with a lot of rocks on our property. It may not seem like that to begin with as a blessing, but you can use rocks. Most rocks that you will find would be safe. Concrete blocks, and, and the rocks typically are gonna be mobile. So if you decide you don't wanna do uh, raised beds, you can get rid of them later and put a flower bed in or something else. Um, concrete block, also safe. A lot of, um, releases some lime into the soil, but for here that's just fine. They also can be mobile. In this particular case, these were mortared in. Spaces were left in here. Other materials are poured concrete. This is the garden bed that my husband and I did. And what do you see right off that might be a little problem? That's not your standard bed. It's bigger than four by eight. It's closer to eight by eight. Okay, so if you're gonna step into your garden bed, what do you wanna do to mitigate compaction? I have mobile stepping stones. They're big. They spread the weight over a greater area, and I'm not in the beds that often. So, um, a little bit more than what most people want. I look at this right outside my kitchen all the time, and so it was the aesthetics that were more <laughs> important than the practicality. These, this is right here at the center. The culverts are for people who have problems le leaning over or are in wheelchairs. Very clever, I thought. Now we talk about things like creosote. All right, the beginnings of our garden were with free railroad ties. If you use railroad ties, you just need to make sure you're using very weathered ones. If they're exuding tarish, gooey stuff, then they're a little bit too fresh. So what we have here, this is the old part, which by the way, they started sinking and deteriorating anyway. But the main thing with the creosote, if it's, if it's damp and wet and not weathered enough, then you can put a heavy plastic, a three or four mil plastic down between the creosoted boards and your soil. With any of these, it's best to move your root plants in at least six inches from the edge. If a plant decides to fall over a creosoted timber that's too fresh, the gases will kill that plant. So it's, it's pretty close to just where it's touching, but it still happens. Okay, then we have, oops, 
wrong one. Then we have treated wood. And we do have um, one that used to be used, chromiated copper arsenate. And notice arsenate? Does that sound familiar? Kind of like <laughs> arsenic? Yeah. Well, that's what it is. Um, that was banned from residential on December 31st, 2003, I think it is. Well, I don't see it here. Here it is. Oh, three. So you shouldn't have any. But if, what if you move to a place that already has raised garden beds, then what are you going to do? My suggestion is a three to four mil plastic and you line the inside of them because you don't know what was in it. Now, they do not believe that even the one that's got the arsenic in it is a danger to human beings because it's not taken up by the plants, they say. So they have other products now that are safer. Um, if you're going to garden for another 30 years, that's when you go to something like the poured concrete, you go to cedar, redwood, and now there's some juniper that's available. And those woods will last a long time. For us, what we found with the creosote timbers, the old railroad ties, they were pretty old. They lasted about 15 years, and the time that I knelt down on my knees to reach into the garden bed and harvest somebody, and my knees went through, I said, oh my, it's time. And then what we calculated, it was another 15 years, and this was after we hauled these things from the front yard up the hill to the backyard, um, we decided we might be a little too old to want to do that anymore. <laughs> so we went for something more permanent. Okay, so again, winter weather, you can get access if you have grass and sod. If it gets really, really wet and you're trying to go in too often, even the grass, the mud will come up through and it'll get <coughs> slick and slimy. So it's not the best. Ground bark or shredded bark, uh, shredded wood. Sand and gravel, the only thing with the uh, gravel and sand, sometimes the gravel will have a sandy mix in the middle and then you track it right into the kitchen. My kitchen garden is right off the kitchen. And yeah, everything gets tracked in. Rock and brick, they look nice. I think the brick is a little bit more formal, so depending on what kind of bed you're making or what materials you have for free. Never discount free. Um, both rock and brick, the biggest problem I see with them is that they do leave spaces for weeds to come up and for slugs and snails to lay their eggs and hide. Cardboard and newspaper is good, but I always recommend putting something over the top of it. We have a good wind come along, <coughs> newspaper dries out, and the next thing you've got newspaper all over the yard. The quick and easy ones are just soil, leaves, and yard debris. You've got twigs. I mean, right now I've got twigs everywhere. Okay, so the grass and sod looks really pretty nice between the raised beds here. You notice one side is now poured in concrete. The terraced ones are still in the timbers. We haven't decided what to do there. The brick, really nice, but you'll see it also gets moss grows on it. Oh yeah, that's a hand cleaning job every other year or so. And cleaning out the other. Now, the rocks down here, these were just fresh laid so I could take pictures for this class. So they haven't had time for the weeds to come back up through them. Okay, so now we're going to talk about making just a simple raised bed. It's also called mounded or unframed. And you'll notice there's kind of a little bordered area here where the stuff has been turned. So you're going, you've already figured out your location, you've already figured out what size, you've figured out what materials you're going to use. Well, in this case, we're doing unframed, so materials are not that big a deal. Everything is there that we need. So you mark out the perimeter, you remove all the weeds and things, and then you're going to turn or fork the area. Now some of you are not fortunate enough to, oops, oops, what did I just do? That's still there, okay. Let's put that down. Um, some of you aren't fortunate enough to have sandy loam. This is at my mother's house where they've had a drought. This is sandy, sandy loam. This is river bottom, which is really close to the truth. But if you have soil like we do around here that you can dig through the first few inches and all of a sudden you hit a clay layer <laughs> or really compacted something, a spading fork is real handy. And they are a little bit different because of the way the tips come down on these forks. They give you a little bit of a spade at the bottom. Some are more pronounced than others. Now this is a short one. If you think you're going to do a lot of reefing, you'll want a longer, taller handle. But the idea is you push this into the soil with your foot, and then you're just going to move it kind of back and forth. 
And this is not so important for the top layer typically as it is to get it kind of broken up down below. And it, just wiggling that apart a little bit gives the earthworms a chance to get down in there and any amendments that you might add will also kind of fall in there. And so what it does is it gives you a better ground. Oh, what do you mean five minutes? All right. <laughs> so this is what it looks like when you have compost going over it. This was a one cubic foot bag of composted steer manure. That's a four foot bed. And so it went four feet by one foot, three inches deep. So if you have an eight foot bag and you're doing a four by eight bed, you'd need eight bags. Not bad. The compost turned in, it just kind of shows you that it does improve the soil, depending, and you can see it if it's sandy soil. And then the walkway has been shoveled up, and that's what makes the top of the bed. Now, you're going to take a rake and you're going to kind of smooth off the top. You've got to have sides, and they're going to slope about six inches, or the slope won't stay up there. Um, on the left is a metal rod with PVC around it. A hose will slide around that very easily. The other one is just an old shovel handle. My mother seems to break shovels with great frequency. <laughs> and it also will help. It'll keep the bed from being destroyed, number one. But the plants is what I worry about most. So tips for making a raised bed. Particularly for women or, or fellows who are getting older and really don't want to have to put out quite that much energy, dig it twice. It is much easier. You go through and you turn it about three inches deep. You don't have to go and then reef on it to try to get down to six inches or eight inches. The second time you go through, the top three inches is already loose. So you're not really digging that. You're digging the next couple, three, four inches down. It's a little easier. Use screws if you're going to do wood. And use blocking at the corners. This one You'll notice the wood is pushing out. And it's pushing out more at the bottom than the top parts. Now, it could be partly the cut of the wood, but also they butted the wood up. So you had the screws going into the end grain. There's nothing really there to hold them. That bed is going to have to be replaced. The other bed, this one happens to be from the ones out here. Sometimes you need a little blocking in between, so if you have an eight-foot bed, you need to have more blocking. Extra drainage, if it's particularly deep. And so this one, they left this as a drainage area, a nice cap for sitting on. These, ha I think, may have come with them, but maybe not. And these are fairly deep. It pays to go out and take a look at those. The test. OK. What am I? Am I a raised bed? This is a bale of hay on a cart. Raised bed? No. No. It's not in touch with the native soil. It is a container. OK. These, I'll give you a hint. The concrete is poured up to the bed. Raised bed? No. Yes. Boy, we're going to have to take the class again. <laughs> All right. This one? No. no. This one? Yes. Yes. Very good. <laughs> and that ends the program. I think that, yep, yeah, that ends that one. If you. <laughs>